As we look at Psalm 82, it's one of those psalms that really uh, has an awful lot to say, and especially want to take some time to look at some application, especially as it pertains to some of the things that have been taught by the church in regards to some of the things that are said here, especially when we look at verse 6. So let's begin reading at, at verse uh, 1 here in Psalm 82, and we'll read to verse 8, read the whole psalm, and then we'll get into our study. Psalm 82, beginning at verse 1. The psalmist Asaph writes, God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Selah. Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Free them from the hand of the wicked. They do not know, nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are unstable. I said you are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High, but you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all nations. Now, as we look at this psalm, the psalm of Asaph, it's a rebuke to the judges of the nation. And what is happening here as we lay the, uh, the context uh, out before you is that the judges of Israel have sinned, and they have sinned by showing partiality in their judgments. Notice how he says here in verse 1 how that God stands in the congregation of the mighty and judges among the gods. So he's speaking concerning the fact that, that God is dealing right now uh, with the, the people who are making judgments. And I'm going to show you some things in a moment. But he's dealing with the fact that they're showing partiality. Now, as we look at this, um, notice how he says he judges among the gods. Uh, there are some who, who will argue different points on this. And I'm going to give you a couple of ways to look at this and then the way that I lean uh, some believe that in this particular psalm that God is judging demons that energize the nations that are oppressing Israel. Others believe that God is judging the false gods of the pagans or the actual God that is being worshipped. But what God is judging here is uh, the judges, the unjust judges in the nation of Israel. Now, let me develop a background for you, lay a foundation, and then move into our study uh, God gave the judges of the nation of Israel specific uh, commands concerning how they were to judge the nation. If you take notes, Leviticus in chapter 19, verse 15, uh, says this, You shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty. In righteousness you shall judge your neighbor. Deuteronomy 16, verse 19, You shall not pervert justice, you shall not show partiality nor take a bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the righteous. And so a judge was to be impartial. A judge was to judge in a righteous way. And these judges had been placed over the nation of Israel to represent God. And because God judges righteously, the judges over the nation of Israel were to exercise righteousness as they judged also. The Bible teaches us that God judges fairly, and therefore those who represent Him must also judge fairly. Deuteronomy 10, 17 says, The Lord your God is a God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality nor takes a bribe. In Acts chapter 10, verse 34, the apostle Peter said, Of truth, I, per I perceive that God is not a respecter of persons. And so as he's speaking here, he's speaking concerning the fact that God is judging among the gods or God is judging among the judges there in the nation of Israel. And he asks the question in verse 2, how long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? And so what is happening is they are judging unjustly, and that's why God is dealing with them. Because in their judging with partiality, they fail to represent God properly. Proverbs 24, 23 says, these things also belong to the wise. It's not good to show partiality in judgment. And again, Deuteronomy 1, 17, you shall not show partiality in judgment. You shall hear the small as well as the great. You shall not be afraid in any man's presence, for judgment is God's. The case that is too hard for you, bring to me, and I will hear it, Moses said. And so there's to be no partiality in judgment. That's what he's speaking about here when he's speaking in these first two verses. Now, in verse 3, when he says, Defend the poor and fatherless, do justice to the afflicted and needy. Verse 4, Deliver the poor and needy, 
free them from the hand of the wicked. He's simply saying that a righteous judge is going to defend, is going to do justice, is going to deliver, and he's going to free those who are being unjustly treated because the Lord intends judges to care properly for those who are in need. Now, when it says in verse 5, they do not know, nor do they understand, they walk about in darkness, all the foundations of the earth are unstable, he's simply saying this, and now we're going to get some... Get Practical, and then I'm going to move you into a theological controversy and probably leave you there. No, I'm going to try and draw you out of it too. But I want you to see something. When he says in verse 5, all of this is relating to judgment. All of this is related to judging righteously. All of this is related to using God's standards in justice and representing him, obviously in context, He's speaking to the judges over the nation of Israel who would use the law of God as they made their judgments. Now, as somebody representing God in the nation of Israel, as a judge, they are to show no partiality. They're not to look at a poor person and say, well, he's poor, therefore I'll give to him a favorable decision because they're poor. Any more than they're to look at a rich person and say, I'll favor them because they have a lot of money. Because whether it's rich or whether it's poor, the standard is to be the same because justice is even. Justice is always equal. You need to see that. Now, what happens when people don't use God's righteous standards? Well, that's what he's talking about in verse 5 when he says, they do not know, nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness, and all the foundations of the earth are unstable. When God's righteous standards in judgment are not being utilized, the result is chaos. The result is instability. That's the point that he's making here. Now, I have to be careful not to go too far, but I will use one example because it's a recent example. In September, some of us have already heard the news, in September, in the state of Louisiana, the state voted concerning um, whether or not they should honor same-sex marriages. And there was an overwhelming response negative to that. 78% of those who voted in the state of Louisiana voted against recognition of same-sex marriage. So the voters spoke, but a judge overturned the will of the people. And that happens all the time. It was, uh, was presented to us just today that uh, yesterday a judge overturned the will of the people. That happens all the time when you refuse to use standards that are righteous. And so what happens when judges are not using righteous standards will always be that they walk about in darkness and chaos ensues. That's what he means when he says the foundations of the earth are unstable. Because that which would be a strong foundation is moved, there is no stability, and so God's righteous standards are to be honored. Now, in verses 6 and 7, I want you to see this. This is an interesting portion where God says, I said you are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High, but you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Now, I want you to see this. I underlined this in verse 6 where, where he says, I said you are gods. Now, what an interesting thing to say. What is this saying? Is it saying that these judges, these men, are actually gods? Is that, what he, is that what he's saying? Now, there are those in theological circles who do teach that uh, man is a god. Uh, those of you who've been Christian for a while, if you've had any conversations with, uh, with Mormons, know that Mormons believe that uh, you can become a god. That's part of Mormon theology. They believe that you can become a god. They believe that God was a man. And they also believe that, that you can become a god also. Now, that's part of Mormon theology. If you didn't know that, all you need to do is speak to a, a, a young Mormon who will show up at your house eventually and, and ask him that question. Is it true that you believe that, uh, that men become gods? And the answer would be yes. And the answer also is that you will one day, as a man, you will have your own planet and you can have your celestial wives, and you can have children and populate it. They believe that Adam once was, uh, Adam is a god. They call him Adam God, and, and, and that's just part of their theology. Um, and we know that. But there are others that are recognized as genuine Christians, uh, some who have, have seen them on their television programs 
and, and these who are regarded as genuine Christian teachers have also taught the same thing. As a matter of fact, they will quote uh, this verse, which says, I said you are God's, and they will, they will combine that with uh, the Gospel of John chapter 10. Now, why don't you turn there for a minute, because I'm going to stay here in this thought for a little while here. In John chapter 10, and I want to show you something. In verse 34, John chapter 10, verse 34. In John chapter 10, verse 34, John records there's a conversation going on between Jesus and some who are opposing him. In verse 33, the Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, because you being a man make yourself God. And then in verse 34, Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, you are gods? And so what, what these teachers will do and have done in the past, and, and I'm going to quote them exactly, is they will say that we are actually gods, that we are little gods. Um, various TV teachers have made this claim. Some of these names you perhaps will recognize. For example, Kenneth Copeland. Kenneth Copeland said... Now, Peter said, by exceeding great and precious promises, you become partakers of this divine nature. All right, are we gods? And then his answer, we are a class of gods. Kenneth Hagin once said, man lived in the realm of God. He lived on terms equal with God. The believer is called Christ. That's who we are. We are Christ. Paul Crouch said, I am a little God, critics be gone. And Kenneth Copeland said, God is a being that stands six foot two, six foot three, he weighs somewhere in the neighborhood of a couple of hundred pounds, a little better. He has a hand span of nine inches across. Some of these fellas, these men that I've mentioned, I'm certain that some of you have heard the names, Kenneth Copeland, Paul Crouch, Kenneth Hagen. There are many others I could have quoted. I just quoted a few of them. I mean, there's so many more that I can quote, who said exactly the same kinds of things, who were saying that Jesus Christ taught by using the Psalms that we are actually gods. And the question is, is that true? Was Jesus saying that men in reality are gods? Well, the answer has to be no, because that would fall, that would actually fly in the face of Scripture, because the Scripture declares there is only one God. In Isaiah 43, verse 10, the Bible says, before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. Isaiah 45, 5 says, I am the Lord, there is no other, there is no God besides me. In the New Testament, 1 Timothy 2, verse 5, there is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So if we on the one hand note that God, back in Psalm 82, verse 6, says, I said you are God's, if we note that Jesus in John 10, 34 quoted Psalm 82, verse 6, you are God's, and yet we see the witness of Scripture, old and new, is there's only one God, the question has to be asked, what is Jesus saying then? When Jesus is quoting Psalm 82, verse 6, and as we look at Psalm 82, verse 6, uh, Jesus is actually referring to Psalm 82 as a psalm of judgment against the judges of Israel, as I shared in our introduction. And God is referring to the judges as gods because they were to represent God to the people. Notice here in Psalm 82, verse 1, how it says he judges among the gods. Now, when he says that, the word gods in the Hebrew language is the word Elohim. And Elohim is a word that is used for gods. It is also used for rulers, and it is used for the word judges. In Exodus 22, verse 9, the Bible says any kind of trespass whether it concerns an ox, a donkey, a sheep, or clothing, or for any kind of lost thing which another claims to be his, the cause of both parties shall come before the judges. That word judges there is the Elohim, and whomever the Elohim condemns shall pay double to his neighbor. The word Elohim there is the word judge. They were called gods in this context because they're administering righteous judgment. When they fail to do so, they're going to be judged by the true God. That's the point that's being made here. 
It isn't that you and I can run around saying, I am a little God. It's that you and I understand that there's only one God. And when judgment is being made, there's only one who has the right to make that judgment, that is God. And therefore, if I'm making judgment on his behalf, then I use his standards. And his standards come from his word. And as long as I am making judgment according to his word, in other words, determining what God's word says on this matter, then I am, I'm going to be uh, doing it in a righteous or a proper way. If I should do it incorrectly, then I am misrepresenting God, and in doing so, God brings judgment on me. That's what he means in verse 7 when he says, you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. I said that you are a judge, but you are not righteously judging. And because you are not righteously judging, then I will bring judgment on you. That's what God is saying here in Psalm 82. And then he finally says in verse 8, Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all nations. So he concludes that God will, will bring justice on earth and prevail. Now, what I just shared with you, uh, some of you might have memories long enough to remember when that uh, little God's uh, controversy was a big thing in the church. It's amazing to me how winds of doctrine enter into the church and make a lot of casualties and then sweep on out. But it wasn't that long ago that I was having conversations with people who honestly believed that they were little gods because they were listening to these men on TV who were telling them so. Well, the Scripture doesn't teach that at all. What the Scripture is talking about in Psalm 82, uh, the whole psalm, is that the judges of Israel are not judging righteously, and God is bringing judgment on them, and that's what Psalm 82 deals with. Now, let's move into Psalm 83, and I'll try and confuse you some more with the new psalm. Beginning at verse 1, Do not keep silent, O God. Do not hold your peace, and do not be still, O God. For behold, your enemies make a tumult, and those who hate you have lifted up their head. They have taken crafty counsel against your people and consulted together against your sheltered ones. They have said, Come and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. For they have consulted together with one consent. They form a confederacy against you, the tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and Hagarites, Gebal, Ammon and Amalek, Philistia and the inhabitants of Tyre. Assyria also has joined with them, and they have helped the children of Lot, said Lot. Deal with them as with Midian, as with Sisera, as with Jabin at the brook Kishon, who perished at Endor, who became as refuse on the, on the earth. Make their nobles like Oreb, and like Zeb, yes, all their princes like Zeba and Zalmanah, who said, let us take for ourselves the pastures of God for a possession. Oh, my God. Make them like the whirling dust, like the chaff before the wind, as a fire burns the woods, as a flame sets the mountains on fire. So pursue them with your tempest and frighten them with your storm. Fill their faces with shame that they may seek your name, O Lord. Let them be confounded and dismayed forever. Yes, let them be put to shame and perish, that men may know that you, whose name alone is the Lord, are the most high over all the earth. And so Psalm 83 is another psalm of Asaph. And Asaph is crying out to the Lord that the Lord might destroy the enemies of Israel. Now, I want you to notice something in the first eight verses. Uh, Asaph is pointing out that, that when, when people hate God, they also will hate God's people. And what they will do is they will conspire against them. Notice the names of Israel's uh, enemies. And, and I won't go into a long thing with them, but Edom it represents uh, Jordan today. The Ishmaelites are Bedouins. Uh, Moab uh, is, is a nation that was a descendant of Lot. The Hagarites are unknown, basically, and Gebal is uncertain. Ammon is also a descendant of Lot, and Amalek was at the southern border of Israel. Philistia is where the Philistines come from. Tyre is to the north, and Assyria was a dominating kingdom in the 8th century before Christ. But the point he's making here, and I want you to see this in verse 3, is that they've taken crafty counsel against your people and consulted together against your sheltered ones. They've said, come let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. So hatred for Israel is not a new thing. We have today people who would do the same thing and are saying the same thing. We don't want Israel to exist any longer. Well, that's not a new thing. That's something that's been going on for centuries. It's referred to here in this psalm that was written centuries before Christ. 
And the bottom line is Israel's enemies have always wanted God's uh, people to no longer exist. You see that true in the Old Testament as well in the, as is in the New. There are some today who really think that the world would be better off without Christians. And they say that. I mean, I remember reading something in the, uh, one of the local newspapers in a letter to the editor, and he was basically saying that, that the world would be a lot better off if there were no Christians in it. And I thought, well, you know, you're going to get your wish because when the rapture happens, there will be no Christians in it anymore. You will get your wish. It will happen. And then let's see how happy times are at that point because people don't like Christians, and that's really true. And they would like to eliminate Christians from the public square. There's no doubt about that. Uh, I was reading today that the U.S. Equal Employment Commission reported that religious discrimination has gone up an overwhelming 82% over the past 11 years. I was reading about a fourth grader by the name of Raymond Rains uh, who went to Waring Elementary School in St. Louis, Missouri, and he was sent to the principal for saying grace before eating his lunch. In 1994, that occurred. In January 15, 2002, a little girl, a kindergartner by the name of Caleb Brodus in Saratoga Springs, New York, was silenced and scolded for praying, God is good, God is great, thank you, God, for my food. Her teacher reported the infraction to the school's lawyer who said her prayer was a violation of separation of church and state. She's five years old. She's saying, thank, thank you, God, for my bologna sandwich. <laughs> judge Samuel B. Kent, the U.S. District Judge for the Southern District of Texas, in May 1995 stated that any student uttering the word Jesus would be arrested and incarcerated for six months. He said, anyone who violates these orders, no kidding, is going to wish that he or she had died as a child when this court gets through with it. I could go on and on and on. I've got a book that has nothing but cases of discrimination against Christians in the public square. You know, the fact is, is that the nation of Israel had enemies who wanted them to cease to exist. And the church to this day has enemies of the church who wishes that you and I would not exercise our freedom of speech and belief and faith. They would love it if you ceased declaring the things that God has spoken in his word. They would love you to just go away. Now, they don't mind if you have your religious beliefs. They have a problem with the fact that you actually act them out that you actually live them out and all, and, and there's no doubt about that. So when you're looking at this psalm, and it was brought to mind as I was looking at it, uh, that, that there were enemies against the nation of Israel then as there are enemies against the church today. Jesus in John 15, verse 18, said it this way. He said, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. He said in Luke 6, 6 22, blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you and revile you and cast out your name as evil, for the Son of Man's sake. In 1 John 3, 13, uh, John said, Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. You know, there are a lot of Christians who you just don't understand why people don't like them. And uh, I learned a long time ago that you can't please everyone, so you've got to please the Lord. You, you can't please everyone. There are people who won't tell their mom or their dad about Jesus Christ, who will not share the gospel with them because they don't want to offend their mom or their dad. There are people who will not share with their grandmother or grandpa. They won't share with the co-worker. They won't talk to anybody about the Lord because they're afraid of offending them. Well, the bottom line is, is that the gospel of Jesus Christ is offensive. I mean, Jesus Christ is the rock of offense, and people do stumble over him. But the bottom line is, is that's not, that's not the reason to, to not speak. I really believe that the Lord gives us opportunity to share. And, and when he opens the door for us to do so, we need to step in through that door and share what God has placed on our hearts, even if people don't like us, even if people will say things unkindly about us and even hurt our feelings. Because the bottom line is, is that they don't hate you. They're hating the Lord. They hated him before they hated you. And so when you share and somebody says, you know what, why don't you shut up? Or when they say, you know, why don't you just, you know, keep your, your faith to yourself? You know, that's, that's no reason to go home saying, oh, boo-hoo, poor me. Nobody likes me. I'll never talk about Jesus again. No, what you do is you go home and you say, well, Lord, you know, I'm, I'm starting to learn that those who shall live godly and godly lives in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. I'm beginning to understand what that's all about. So, Lord, I ask that I might love you so much that I'll be willing, even if mom and dad want nothing to do with me, that I'd be willing to just share because it's true and because these people need you, Lord. 
may I have the strength to do that. And so as the psalmist is speaking here, he's saying that there is a confederacy against the nation of Israel that is in, re in reality against God, and there are all these nations that are, are wanting to destroy the nation of Israel. But in verse 9, he goes on to pray, deal with them as with Midian, as with Sisera, and as with Yabin at the brook Kishon, who perished at Endor, who became as refuse on the earth, make their nobles like Oreb and like Zeb. Anybody here named their kid Zeb? Uh, yes, all their princes like Zeba and Zalmanah, who said, let us take for ourselves the pastures of God for a possession. Now, as you look at this, he actually gives us uh, some uh, insight into Jewish history that is worthy of considering for a moment. When he says, deal with them as with Midian, well, that brings to mind what God did to the Midianites when God was using a man by the name of Gideon. Gideon is one of the more interesting men in the Scriptures. He's one of the judges of Israel and is spoken about in Judges 6 through 8. And Gideon was an interesting guy. He was uh, afraid of the Midianites, and so he was in... He was actually hiding from them as he was threshing out some, uh, some grain when the angel of the Lord appeared to, to Gideon. And, and the angel of the Lord spoke to Gideon in this way. He said, Hail thou mighty man of valor. Now when he's speaking to a man who's hiding for fear of the Midianites and calling him a man of valor, that's always intrigued me. But I've discovered something about the Lord. The Lord has a way of seeing you in a way that you don't even see yourself. And so he starts to speak to him. And as he speaks to Gideon and all, he's basically saying that the Lord is going to use him to deliver the children of Israel. Now, I'll encapsulate his story and get to the point here because he's using him as an example. Ultimately, what God says to him is this. I'm going to use you to deliver the nation of Israel. And so I want you to be basically the general who's going to use the, uh, be uh, over the army and all. Get together the fighting man of Israel. So he gets together the fighting men of Israel, and he numbers them, and there are 32,000 soldiers. And then he says, if any of you are afraid to go into battle, then, then just go on home. And immediately, 22,000 people turn and walk away. Now, that wouldn't have done me much good, thinking, there goes, you know, two-thirds of my army. Now I've got 10,000. And now he's saying, well, we've got another test. Let's go to this brook and, and uh, drink some water. He watches them. He sees some get down on all four. He sees some lap it like a dog. The ones who lap up the water like the dog were numbered 300. And with these 300, God is intending to deliver the nation of Israel. And so he sends 9,700 home, and out of 32,000 original soldiers, he ends up with 300. And that gives us insight that God doesn't need a lot of people. God just wants to use whoever is willing to be used. That's one of the reasons why our men's ministry is called the Gideons. Because in the midst of all the men that we have, we know there's a small group that want to be used by the Lord. So we call them the Gideons to encourage them so that they'll be like Gideon's men. And so with these 300, God says, here's your strategy of battle. I want you to divide into three sets of 100, and I want you to stand on the hill, and I want you to have a pot in one hand, I want you to put your, a torch in it, and I want you to have the sword in the other. He says, and then at a certain time, I want you to break the pot so that the light shines forth, and when you do so, just shout out the sword of the Lord and of Gideon, and watch what happens. And so these men are all stationed over the hills, there's 120 plus thousand enemies encamped, and you've got 300 guys with a sword and a lantern in a pot. And those are the soldiers that God is going to use. And so at the right time, they break the pot, the light shines forth, and the people go into a panic, and they actually kill one another and take off running. So that teaches me that God can use cracked pots. One of the things that the Lord taught me through that story and it's just a very basic thing the light was doing no good until the pot was broken I want you to think about this for a moment the light did no good until the pot was broken when the pot was broken the light shone forth and the vessels that God will use when he wants to bring a victory will always be a broken vessel because the broken vessel allows light to shine through. And inasmuch as God is in your life through faith in Jesus Christ, and he is the light, the true light that lighteth every man that enters into the world, 
when that light begins to shine forth, it normally shines forth through a broken vessel. And the thing that will keep you from being used by the Lord is when you are not willing to be that broken vessel. When the vessel is busted, the light shines and victory comes. And I have seen that to be true in my life. As long as I have thought that God has a prize when he got hold of me, I'm not usable. But when God, through series through life and circumstances, breaks this pot, when the pot is broken, the light shines forth and God gets victory. And that's how it works. All they needed to do is shout out the sword of the Lord and Gideon. And when they did that, the enemy actually slaughtered itself. Victory came without them having to do anything. Now, as that takes place, they begin to chase them down. And as they chase them down, they caught up with these princes. That's who's being spoken of in verse 11. These were the nobles that are, are mentioned in verse 11, Oreb and Zeb. They caught up with them, and they, and they killed them. And the other ones, Zeba and Zalmunna, were actually kings. They actually caught up with them too, and they put them to death. And that's what he's speaking about when he says in verse 9, deal with them as with Midian. Now, when he speaks of Sisera, Sisera was a general under a king by the name of Jabin, who was a Canaanite king. And Sisera was, again, this is found in Judges chapter 4, Sisera was uh, opposing the nation of Israel. And Deborah, who was the judge, uh, had come up to a man by the name of Barak and said, you are to command an army of 10,000 and go against uh, uh, Sisera. And um, he said, I won't do it unless you go with me. And so Deborah said, listen, I'll go with you, but the honor that God was going to give to you, which was to be the victorious general, he's going to give to a woman. So when they went against uh, the army, the general uh, Sisera and his, and his troops, uh, ultimately Israel was victorious and Sisera ran away. And as he ran away, he came to a tent. And as he came to this tent, it was a tent of a, a woman by the name of Jael. And he said, hide me because I'm, I'm fleeing. And also she put him under some, uh, some blankets, if you will. And he said, I'm very, very tired and I'm very thirsty. Give me some water. So she gives him some warm milk. And as he drinks the warm milk, he gets sleepy. When he gets sleepy, she puts the blanket over him. He falls asleep. And she gets a tent peg. And she puts it on his temple. Goodbye. She nails him to the ground. And so Deborah's word that God would give victory to a woman was fulfilled. But this is used as an example, once again, when he speaks concerning the uh, failure or the loss of Sisera and with Jabin, who was the king. And he says, perished at Endor and became as refuse on the earth. So the point is, as they opposed God, but God delivered the nation of Israel. Going on into verse 13, he goes on to say, Oh, my God, make them like the whirling dust, like the chaff before the wind, as the fire burns the woods, and as a flame sets the mountains on fire. So pursue them with your tempest and frighten them with your storm. Fill their faces with shame that they may seek your name, O Lord. Let them be confounded and dismayed forever. Yes, let them be put to shame and perish, that men may know that you, whose name alone is the Lord, are the most high over all the earth. And so he's saying, make them unsettled and, and pushed around, driven like, uh, like when the wind stirs up dust or drives tumbleweeds. He's saying, defeat them, Lord, and humble them, because in their defeat and in their humiliation, they will come to know that you are God. The psalmist in Psalm 9, verse 20, says it this way, Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. And that's what he's saying. He's saying, teach them that though they may be great amongst men, they are nothing compared to you. That's what it means in verse 16 when it says, Fill their faces with shame, that they may seek your name, O Lord. And verse 18, that men may know that you, whose name alone is the Lord, are the most high over all the earth. Lord, when somebody thinks that they're great, bring humiliation into the life. Humble them so they realize that they can't make it by themselves. Humble them so that they realize that they don't have all that it takes to be able to make it. Bring them to that place of dependence on you. May they have the shame of recognizing that they're not everything they think they are. And do so, Lord, so people might be aware of who you are and that you might have praise over all the earth. 
And then finally, Psalm 84. How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, yes, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They will still be praising you. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Every one of them appears before God in Zion. O Lord, God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob, Selah. O God, behold our shield and look upon the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man who trusts in you. This is a psalm of the sons of Korah. It's been called a pilgrimage song. Notice verses 1 and 2, how he begins, How lovely is your tab tabernacle, O Lord of hosts. Now, as we look at this, this particular psalm, the psalmist is longing to be in the temple. The reason the psalmist is longing to be in the temple, and I want you to see this, is because the temple represents fellowship with God. He has such a great love for God that it's produced a longing for him to be where God is and where God's people are. Now, I want to give you something very practical. And I'll talk as a parent to parents here. If you're a parent, this might help. One of the things when you're raising your kids that I've discovered as I've been raising mine, and I'm not through yet, is uh, they very often, very often, will basically own the things that you own. You know, there's this mentality, oh, man, do I have to go to church again? Well, you know, sometimes we as parents will say, you know, yes, you're going to go to church, and we make it almost a chore. But I've discovered that when I'm excited about being somewhere, when I, I'm excited about going to see somebody or going someplace, as I was raising my kids, that my kids would get excited along with me over whatever it was that I was excited about. When you have an excitement, a joy, a longing, a desire to be in fellowship with God, when that's the heartbeat of your life, when that's the genuine reality of your faith, then you're not forcing your children to do something. You're enjoying going someplace together. And one of the things that I've discovered is that I don't have to force my kids to go to church. All I need to do is enjoy being there because I'm in fellowship with God and I'm, I'm in fellowship with God's people. So this begins in your heart. It, it's not in the way things are done or not done. It begins in your heart. The, the psalmist in Psalm 63, verses 1 and 2 said it this way. He said, Oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there's no water. I've looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. I enjoy being there with you, worshiping you. And that's how it works. When you enjoy being with the Lord, when you love Jesus Christ, listen, before I got saved, I loved to party. If you told me the party was in this location, I'd go to that location. It didn't matter how far I was driving or how long it took to get there. When I got saved, I started saying, what a blessing it is. I get to go worship the Lord. I get to, I get to pray. I get to worship the Lord. I get to hear the Word of God. I get to hang around with, with God's people. I get to be filled with the things of God. And I could remember those early days in my walk with the Lord. And that was before we had so many things that are available to us now. And that was before we had all these uh, selections on, on the radio dial for, for Christian stations. Man, I can still remember. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some old history for a minute. Some of you will understand. Others will go, what? Um, there were no Christian radio stations. I had a, in my car, we didn't even have FM radio. We didn't use FM radio because FM radio was just kind of unheard of. We had AM radio. 
and AM radio, you never got stereo from it or anything like that. And there were just some, mu some musical stations you used to listen to. KHJ used to do, you know, rock and roll. KRLA used to do rock and roll and a couple of others. And that was about it. There was no FM stations. And you didn't have Christian radio on the air. You, you, could, you could dial from, you know, the beginning to the end trying to find some place that had Christian Bible studies or uh, anything like that. You would not find it except on Sunday night. When you turned on the radio Sunday night, you could get XERB, and there would be some Pentecostal preacher screaming at you late at night, and that was about it. And so you didn't have all these selections where you can look at this, you know, 90.1 or, or whatever. I mean, you just didn't have that. You didn't have KKLA. You didn't have K-Wave. You didn't have anything like that. So when I first got saved, I can still remember I was driving in my car at a 62 Ford Falcon station wagon, and I turned on my radio, and I was just saved, and I was driving to a Bible study. And I remember saying, God, I want to worship you. I'm learning how to sing songs to you, and, and it's just me and you. I want to sing. I wish there was a song. Uh, I wish there was a song on the radio that I could sing to you, but there isn't anything like that. And I remember turning the radio on and starting to dial through, and I found My Sweet Lord with George Harrison. And I started singing, My Sweet Lord, and I just kept saying, Hallelujah, and praise the Lord, and I didn't say Hare Krishna and Hare Rama and all of that garbage. And, and I remember that because there was something inside of me. After the Bible studies that we would go to there in Calvary Chapel, we would come back to the house, a friend of mine's house, and we would continue to pray. And we'd, have, we'd hold each other's hands, and we would worship the Lord in the songs that we had heard that night. And we would continue worshiping and praising, opening the Word of God and talking about Jesus. And that's how I was discipled. That was my introduction to Christianity. And I read the Bible at night, every night, because I was told, you're supposed to read the Word of God. And one of my friends got me a King James Bible. And for a person who only read, you know, comic books, the these and the thous and the old English was really tough for me. And so they bought me a good news for modern man, which was a paraphrase. And it was easy to read. And then I eventually bought what was called the Layman's Parallel Bible, which had the King James and three other translations next to it. And I would read the King James, and then I would read the parallel scriptures so I could begin to understand what the King James said. And then I, that's a, that was my only Bible that I had from when I got saved in 1970 until 1983. In 1983, I bought the new King James, and I've been using that to teach from since then. But I would do that, and I actually learned to read King James and, and to study in the King James and all of that. And, and, and it was a hunger in my heart. There was a desire for me to be with God to be in church, I mean, we would pile into the car and off we'd go and we left early so we could get there on time because we had to slide in and find a place to sit. And after it's over, we would jump in the car. We didn't go to a coffee shop or anything else. We drove straight home and we'd go to the house that we were in. We'd pile out of the van or the car or whatever and we'd go into the house and we'd sit down in the front room floor. We'd open the Word of God, speak about what we saw that night, what was being said that night. Then we'd hold hands and pray, and then we'd sing songs, and we did that every day. I did that every day. And I was taught that's what you do as a Christian. That's your life. You have been taken from darkness into light. And so when this psalmist here is saying, how lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts, my soul longs as even faints for the courts of the Lord, my heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. I understand that. Because that's what it means to worship God. I want to be there in the presence of God with the people of God, worshiping God, and I long for that. My soul is thirsty, and it's in a dry place. But when I'm with you, oh, you saturate it, Lord, with your living water. He even admires the birds. The sparrow, verse 3, has found a home. The swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young. Her, her, the bird is there nesting somewhere in the temple area is what he's speaking about, and she raises her, her young there, and he's jealous of the fact that the kids, the little bird, can grow up there in the temple. Even your altars, O Lord, host, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. Uh, they will still be praising you. I, I'm jealous of the priests who are able to be there all the time worshiping and praising you. And then he goes on to say in verse 5, Blessed is the man whose strength is in you whose heart is set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. 
Every one of them appears before God in Zion. Faith is demonstrated by your pursuit of God. That's the point he's making. Faith is demonstrated by your pursuit of God, and he admires the ones who go on the hard journey. That's what he's speaking about in verse 7 when he says, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. He admires the ones who are willing to go on a hard journey just to worship the Lord. When he speaks of Baca, they pass through the valley of Baca. Uh, Baca is a valley that is watered by God. And the point he's making here is that that dry valley is actually remedied by the water that comes from God. And in verse, th and, and he continues on when he says in verse 7, they go from strength to strength. Uh, that's an interesting thought because your strength, pictured by longing, enters into dryness but ends up being watered. Now, let's see how I can put this. And I want to make this as practical as is possible. Verse 5, blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. Blessed is the man, listen carefully, blessed is the person who is willing to go through anything just to be with you, who moves from strength to strength. How do you grow in strength? How do you grow in strength? There's a willingness to go through whatever is necessary in order to be watered by God. That's how you grow in strength. In your walk, you will go through a valley that sometimes is very dry, but God will water you as you go through that valley. And you can start out in a strong place, and you will, in your pilgrimage with the Lord, you can find yourself entering into times of dryness. You started out from strength, but you enter into weakness only to be watered by God and brought back into a place of strength. That's how your spiritual life is. And I've discovered something in the Lord in my own walk, is I can start out strong, but I can end up dry, and then I am revitalized by the Spirit, revived, and I'm brought into even a stronger place. And I believe that the Lord has done that continually in my life to develop in me a strength that would come no other way, and he does the same with you. And sometimes we go through things in our lives that are exceptionally difficult, and sometimes it feels like you're never going to get out of that valley of Baca, that dry place. But as you go through it, the Lord brings that water, resuscitates, and strengthens you. Last night, I got a phone call at um, about one. See, Marie, my wife, was at the pastor's wives conference. She left on Sunday and came back today. And so I was in bed, and my son David is going to a, a class at night. And um, my Anna was home. Joseph is at school. And I was asleep. I, I went to bed about 11.30, and it's now about 1 o'clock, and, and I'm pretty tired. And, and my Anna comes in and says, Dad, Dave's on the phone, my, my son David. He's on the phone, Daddy. So I answer the phone, yes, son, what's wrong? Dad, my car was just totaled. The car was just totaled. My son was sitting, I guess, at a light. He had one of his friends who was in front of him. His friend is right, driving a motorcycle. A car came out of nowhere, estimated between 50 and 70 miles an hour, and blew through a corner. The motorcyclist in front of David, his friend, seeing the car come, shot out. David doesn't see a thing because it's coming so fast and he's looking down, but he has his car in first gear. When the motorcyclist took off as fast as he did, David saw a flash to his left and began to move. His car was only able to move. He said, Dad, I just barely was able to get it rolling. When he got broadsided last night, the guy was estimated to be going over 50 miles an hour when he made contact with my son's car. Totaled it. It T-boned his car. The left rear tire was bent at an angle. That's how hard it hit. And David calls me at 1 in the morning and says, Dad, I just got my car totaled. I said, are you okay, son? He says, I'm fine, but an ambulance is here, Dad. I'll call you right back. 
So I'm laying there in bed until 1.30 waiting for my son to call me back. He calls me back at 1.30. He says, well, they were checking me out, Dad. I'm a little sore, but I'm more in shock. And I said, what happened? And he explains what took place. And it hit me. I've been praying for my son. I pray for my kids like you pray for your friends and your family. I pray for my kids a lot, all the time. When they leave, I'm praying for them. God, be with them, protect them, keep them, strengthen them, Lord. Bring them home safely. I do that all the time. But last night, I almost lost my son. Last night, I almost lost my son. Because if his car had not moved just those few inches, this truck that ran into him would have hit him straight in the side, at the driver's side. And at 50 to 70 miles an hour, his, he's got these airbags that are supposed to go off, didn't go off, and he could have died. He, he said, Dad, he said, my, all the, he said I'm in, I was just in shock. He said, but I couldn't breathe. I said, son, you flew around in that car so hard, it knocked all of the air right out of your lungs. That's why you, you didn't have any oxygen. And you know, as I was laying there, and then he said, well, I'm okay, Papa, I'll be home in a little while. He got home after, you know, so much having to do so much at 3 in the morning. And I'm, I'm asleep, and he taps my, my foot and wakes me up and tells me the whole story. And I, he says, Dad, my car's gone. And my answer is, I can replace a car. I can't replace you. You know, you're not going to get another car, but we could <laughs> replace it. These are the things. These are the things that my family goes through all the time. These are the things where we're walking strong with the Lord, and then you enter into a valley of tears. Then you enter a valley of dryness. You enter into something, but you know, you start with strength, and you end up with even more strength. Because my faith in the Lord grows when my children are preserved like that. And even had my son gone home to be with the Lord, I know where he's going to go. I, I will not lose my son. I will never lose my son because I know where my son is. But these are the things that we go through. When I got saved, there was no guarantee that I wouldn't go through valleys of dryness. There was no guarantee that my life would be just blessed always. You know, in other words, never going through tough times and discovering the other things about God, how he's there and faithful and strengthens you and, and produces patience and, and all of these things. You know, if, if, the, if the evangelist would have said, now that you're a Christian, you need to know that you'll never cry again. You need to know that you're only going to laugh. You know, that you'll put your hand into your wallet. It will be magical. It'll always have money in it. But it didn't happen that way. Not for me. Maybe it happened like that for you. And you should pastor this church and I should listen to what you're learning. But the bottom line is, is this, the psalmist is saying, and I want you to see that, blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage, who is willing to do the difficult thing so that he might get to that place of just worshiping you and just enjoying you. His heart is set on that. There's a cost. There's a cost. But what you receive is worth anything that you give up. Going on, he says, O Lord, o Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. O God, behold our shield. Look upon the face of your anointed. In other words, provide for us, Lord, in every way. You are our shield in Jesus. You are our anointed. And I pray that you would take care of us in, any way, in every way. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God then dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man who trusts in you. Because the pilgrimage is worth it, God blesses you in the end. The Bible tells us in Matthew 6, verse 33, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things shall be added to you. Paul in Philippians 4.19 said, My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. 
And Paul in 2 Corinthians 9, verses 10 and 11 said, He who supplies seed to the sower, bread for food, will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. So he says, Lord, I just ask you just to bless me. Even as he says in verse 11, no good thing will be with uh, will, will he withhold from those who walk uprightly? Father, I'm just asking that as I go on pilgrimage that you'll continue supplying my daily need. And Lord, even as it says in verse 12, blessed is the man who trusts in you. Lord, our lives are, are touched and moved and so blessed because we do trust in you. The word trust, we put our faith in you. Our hope is in you. Our confidence is in you because you never will let us down. Lord, we do trust in you.